Sin City Preacher. Welcome to another session of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today is the third part of our study on the subject of uh, Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement. Uh, if you haven't seen the first two, they're available on my channel, uh, Sin City Preacher. Just go watch them, and we're going to pick up today where we left off. But first, let me introduce the people uh, on the panel. Uh, we we got uh, Brother Mitchell Bolankoff and uh, Sister Tanya Perry. And uh, I'm going to give each one of them just a second to introduce themselves and tell, uh, tell you the name of their YouTube channel. I hope everybody will subscribe to them. Okay, Mitch? How you doing? Yeah, my, my channel is my name. Uh, I've been on for quite some time. Uh, uh, do I have a mic? I don't know if I have a mic. Yes, yeah, we hear you fine. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so uh, I've been on for a long time. Luke has been a, a great friend of mine for, for a long time on YouTube, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Tanya? Hello, everybody. Uh, my channel is Galaxy Dreams 3 on YouTube, and it's uh, obviously a Christian channel. Um, I'm very blunt, and if you don't like the grace of God and uh, the simple gospel message, you're not going to like my channel. Okay. Um, before we get into the uh, continuing where we left off, I want to lay a quick foundation for this study as I did in the first two episodes. And that is, that there's a, I'm going to quote, I don't know who said this, but this is perfectly describing the purpose of the Old Testament for, the, for us, the New Testament. Quote, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It is almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out a play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience of the play those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words and events in this play. Put it more simply, the theme of the Old Testament is the Messiah is coming, bringing salvation. The theme of the New Testament is the Messiah is here, bringing salvation. So, I've had people... Uh, tell me that uh, do you spend much time studying the, the Old Testament uh, or, or, or are you just spending all your time in the New Testament? And even though personally I've read the New Testament um, more times than I can count, uh, I've, I've read the New Old Testament all the way through probably three, four, five times. So I've spent a lot more time studying the New Testament. But to me what this study is going to show you, you viewers, is that when we understand the message of salvation through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ uh, that we learn in the New Testament, and then we look at the Old Testament through that lens, we're going to see that uh, from the very beginning it was uh, forecasting, uh, showing uh, uh, all kinds of things. We're all pointing to this future blood atonement that Jesus Christ died for our sins. So we've already covered a lot of examples, but now let me see if I can find where we left off last time. And if the panelists uh, you want to uh, interject at any point, you can go ahead, but I'm going to ask your opinion as we go. Uh, we're, we got to the point now where we, we talked about what happened in the garden, we talked about what happened with Moses, and, and finally we reached uh, Joshua. Uh, who is a picture of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, uh, leading the people to the promised land. Just as Jesus Christ gets us to the promised land. Our promised land is the, uh, having eternal life in the kingdom of God. But now we're at the point now where we're going to be discussing things like uh, the tabernacle, items in the tabernacle. Uh, so the tabernacle uh, is representative of God, living with the Jewish people. And is there anything that either of you want to talk about just off the top of your head about the tabernacle itself? We know that uh, uh, they, 
they had the Ark of the Covenant, and then once they found a final place, they established a, a temple and a tabernacle. But does anybody want to um, go first, or do you want me to, to talk about it? Go ahead, Mitch, if you, if you have something to say. Otherwise, I have a couple of news. Well, it's the word tabernacle itself. I never knew what tabernacle meant. You know, it's, it's very strange, the word tabernacle. It's like a tent, you know, the yeah. tent of meeting. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, so uh, the tent is something that, that, that uh, was constructed and deconstructed uh, and then followed the cloud. Or the or or the you know wherever wherever the the, 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 the cloud stopped that's where the tabernacle was to be uh, uh, put up whenever the cloud moved you had to break camp and take all of these parts and and and, and um, um, until finally the the the, uh, the resting place uh, wound up with David uh, finally um, or Solomon building the temple David wanted to build it so uh, so basically what I see is that, that, that um, the tabernacle at that time led the Jews on, a, on, a, on a, uh, the, the people on a journey of faith until it went into the, the promised land. And the significance of that, uh, you know, I don't want to get into that, that um, right now, but there is, uh, when we talk about the feasts and the holidays, there's a feast called Sukkot or Sukkot, depending on the way, uh, which type of Jew you are, whether Ashkenazi or Sephardic. And in that holiday, for a week, Jews spend time in a, it's not actually a tent, it's a, like a, a makeshift little shack that only has leaves on the top, so if it rains, they get rained on. And it's a major holiday, and it's basically a feast that was laid down by God himself to remind the people of their time in the desert. Okay. Uh, so the, the tabernacle... Uh, is the tent. It was a temporary thing that was set up and moved. Uh, and yet, uh, what I'm looking for is uh, uh, the purpose of the tabernacle. Uh, uh, Tanya, do you have anything to say about that before I try to cite some verses? Nope. Sounds good. Go for it. Okay. Uh, the tabernacle, uh, just as God lived with Adam and Eve in the garden, and then we had this barrier, and uh, man was separated from God because of sin. Uh, the tabernacle represents God living with Israel. He dwelled with his people through this tabernacle. And if we look at, let's look at John 14, 1 through 3. I didn't have this written out, so I don't have to find it. So anybody who finds it first, you can read it. John 14, 1 through 3. Okay, I'll read it here. Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, uh, that where I am, there ye may be also. So, it's God's plan that we live with yeah, we were created to uh, live with and have fellowship with God. And this failed in the Garden of Eden, and this relationship with Adam and Eve living and God walking with them uh, it, it's, was severed. But that's really what the, the tabernacle is, God living with the Jewish people. And, uh, and now we're looking forward to a time where we're going to be living with God eternally. Um, if you want to say, I've got another verse, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh. Yes, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. So the, the whole idea here is uh, God made us to live with him and have fellowship with him as, as his children. And... Uh, so Jesus, who is God Almighty, and he was became a man, 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 he was manifest in the flesh, and he did this so he could come down here and live among us. 
and he also came because he needed to die. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, uh, but, to, but to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom. So Jesus came down here to live among us and, and to die for our sins. So the, the thing that I see that, that with the tabernacle is that uh, this is an example of God living with us, the people. And now, unless you want to add to that, let's go look at the bronze altar of sacrifice. Well, I, I would I would have to um, say that yeah, God was among us in a, in a tabernacle. But remember that nobody could get inside the holy of holies except for the high priest without blood. And so I guess we're going to go over the the pieces, the lampstand, the lava, the altar. Yes. And and what that significance is, yes. and that Mo, that Moses was the one that met with God to be. Uh, uh, an intercessory, you know, an intercessor for uh, between the Jewish people and God. So Moses went into the tent, and Moses spoke in the tent. And remember, the Shekinah, the the glory of God was on his face, but it would, it, it, you know, it would it would fade. And so we uh, even talks about an unfading glory uh, later on, uh, and we have that when we have the Holy Spirit. So, um, so there was, although. He was tabernacling among us. The Jews were separated from, you know, from going inside the um, uh, the, the the holy place, mm -hmm. and it was only the high priest, of course, that could go in there, and not without blood. Right. Well, once once a year, that high priest could pass underneath that veil, and uh, they would actually tie a rope to him because, you know, in case he was killed, but he saw God, they had to drag his body out, you know. Uh, so he could go in and, and uh, pass on the other side of the veil in the presence of God once a year. Uh, and then it, we know that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in half, right. split in half, and that, that represents the, uh, the barrier between man and God being broken open. And now there's no more sin barrier that separates man and God because Jesus paid for our sins. Now every one of us has access to God. And, uh, through Jesus Christ. Okay, let's. Um, what about the uh, bronze altar of sacrifice? What was what was done on that bronze altar? The altar. Now the altar had to be covered with blood. Yes, there was a lot of blood put on the altar um, in order to be able to approach the altar. Um, I don't really want to comment too much on it because I, I, I really want to um, basically be a little bit more passive on that. But, uh, but basically, um, um, you know, the sacrifice was on the altar. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a place of, uh, uh, to, you know, where, and, it was, and, and when you approached it, it was, it was covered with blood. It's funny because there was the mercy seat and, and everything like that inside, but the altar, you know, the altar and the mercy seat, um, I'd like to know the, the, the correlation between, between those two. Mm -hmm. Okay, the the altar is where the sacrifice took place, and uh, from the beginning of this whole study, we've cited examples of blood being shed. All through the Old Testament, blood was shed as a remedy. Uh, the first example we had was uh, when Adam and Eve discovered they were naked, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, but that didn't work. It was God wasn't satisfied with that. It, and the only thing that would satisfy God as a covering was uh, um, the death of an animal sacrificed, and the animal skin was used to cover them. So there was, uh, to get this covering that God requires, there's got to be the shedding of blood. And then you also have the example of uh, Cain and Abel, where Cain uh, gave a sacrifice to God that God did not like. Because it was because it was the result of Cain's labor, he presented a works sacrifice. Look, look at all the work I did for you, God, and God was not satisfied. But when Abel gave his sacrifice to God, God uh, approved of it because it was a blood sacrifice. And so we see as we go begin working our way through the scriptures that this blood sacrifice, all through the Old Testament, is the only thing that satisfies God until we finally. These are all pictures of this eventual blood sacrifice 
that would actually pay for our sins, and that was the death of Jesus on the, on the cross. So the the bronze altar is uh, where the animal was sacrificed, and that's a picture of the Jesus being the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for our sins. So would we say that the altar was a picture of the cross? Yes. I would say the altar is the same thing as the cross. Uh, um, that's where the death took place. And then now let's go on to the basin laver. The basin laver. Uh, you know what was done in the basin laver? Well, um, well, labor, of course, means to, to, to wash. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, um, and it's funny, the word uh, laver, I'm wondering if it comes from the word lavan, which is, means white. Um, um, the Jews often washed their hands, and it was called netelet yadaim, where they would wash their hands. That, that means washing your hands. Yadaim, yad, or hands. Yadaim are, are two hands. So, um, so um, if you want to expound upon the, the lava a little bit more, I'd, I'd like to hear. Well, the, 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 the Jews, uh, they, they did a lot of washing. Uh, and one of the things that is, is neat about all these different laws that the God gave the Jews to follow is that uh, before man was aware of bacteria and the spread of disease, because... Uh, the naked eye cannot see bacteria. They didn't have the benefit of microscopes back then. But the, the Jews were the first people where they learned that to, it was healthy to wash all the time. And I don't know if they really even understood what they were actually accomplishing by washing, but it was getting clean, and it made them healthier. And other cultures that would get diseases, the Jews were spared because of their uh, washing regimen. So they always did a lot of washing, and, and some of these things though, were uh, washing in terms of being unclean spiritually. Uh, so it symbolized uh, being clean spiritually, clean of sins, and that is, the, the labor would be uh, comparable to what, how we see baptism today, the washing. Baptism does not really wash away our sins. Uh, our, our sins are paid for because Jesus paid for them on the cross. But the baptism is a picture, just like the, the basin labor was a picture of the cleansing. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I would compare the uh, the basin labor to uh, what we how we view baptism today, water baptism. Um, now, what about the the showbread? That's interesting, showbread. Well, we know that, that, that the lamb was a sacrifice, but he also was the bread of life. Yeah. So, so I would say that, 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 that I can probably draw a, a parallel between, between the showbread and, 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 and uh, Jesus' body being broken for us. Yeah, right. So it's, uh, you've got the... Uh, the tabernacle is God living with us, and now we have the Holy Spirit living with us. We have the bronze altar is the blood sacrifice, and now we know Jesus did fulfill that through his shedding of his blood. And the water, the basin labor is, is like the ritual cleansing, uh, the same way we look at baptism. And then the showbread is a picture of Jesus Christ because he called himself the bread of life. So all these things in the tabernacle, and as we look at through, uh, we go along, we're going to see that everything is comparable to something about Jesus and our salvation in the New Testament. Uh, what about the lampstand? Well, that, that's funny, the lampstand. You know, because, of course, in Revelation, it talked about the churches, uh, you know, uh, being lampstands. But Jesus would be the light. So would you say that the lamp stand, stand is, the, is, 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 uh, is a picture of, of Jesus being the light? Or what would you, what would you say? Uh, I have something else in mind. If I can find Zechariah, there's a verse here. Zechariah 4, 1 through 6. Uh, where is Zechariah? Man? That's a hard one to find. Zechariah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Zechariah. 
See, if I had my glasses, I could, I could see. <laughs> but I don't have my glasses, so, um, so brother, I could be in Jeremiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel. Uh, is that Zechariah? Is that Zechariah? Is that the, the, the Old Testament or the New Testament? That, that, well, Zechariah is the Old Testament, I believe. <laughs> You know, but I can't see the difference even when looking at these tabs because I can't see a thing here. Yeah. Now, a lot of these pe people are going to think because of what I just said that I'm really ignorant of the Bible. I think it might be in the, the New Testament. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching, I, I know it's in the Old Testament. But I'm having a hard time finding where it is right now. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's funny having a Bible with tabs, but I can't read the tabs, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, you can have that uh, eye surgery if you improve your, your vision, but uh, uh, la da da, Zechariah. That's that's back. Hold on a second. I should have marked this off before. Uh, but I thought it'd be really easy to find, so I didn't bother. Well, I should just go get my glasses. It'd probably be easier because I'm looking at uh, at numbers uh, here, and they and they look like Z's, but they're twos. And uh -huh. okay, I guess I have to resort to my okay, twelve e two. I found it through the table of contents. Hold on. I think it's around. Is it? Is it by Zephaniah? Uh, Zechariah? What? It's uh, Zechariah right after Haggai. Okay. Zechariah. I'm in Zechariah. Four, four one through four one through six. All right. Okay. Um, then the angel go ahead. that was speaking with me uh, returned. <laughs> and it's so fuzzy here. <laughs> oh, all right, I'll read it. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon uh, the top of it and with seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which were upon the top thereof and, and two olive trees by it and one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zebubabel, saying, Not by might, not nor by power, but by the, my spirit, saith the Lord. The candlestick is symbolic of, uh, oh, I'm seeing a message from Scott here. Uh, help, I fall along with the whole thing. That would be the light of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to the churches. Okay, uh, let me send a message to Scott. Uh, he's uh, just sent me a message. Okay. Um, okay. The the lampstands are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, so the uh, here we are. The lampstands, and I think you can see also if you go to Revelations too, you'll see the same thing. The lampstands are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So now we got the showbread is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. The lampstands the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at the altar of incense. Hmm. Altar. Altar, altar of incense. Well, it's, that's funny because um, uh, in Revelations, we hear that the incense is like the prayers of the saints. Okay. That's exactly what I'm looking for. That's, to me, that's what, that's what the altar of incense represents. All right. 
Because in Revelation, if you got it, you got it five eight. Revelation, Revelation five eight. Yeah. Yeah, this works really. You know, when I put my glasses on, I can actually see letters. <laughs> And when he had taken the book of the four living uh, the four living creatures and the twenty four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Yes. Okay. So we have each one of these things, uh, this part of this uh, tabernacle in the temple, uh, as representing something that is significant to us. Oh, I see Scott. Excellent. Scott's here. Hey, brother. Brother, hi. Mute. Click your mute. Click your click your uh, uh, mute. Hello. Scott. There. All right, we got you. Is it on? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got it's, you. It's, I don't feel tardy. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't worry about it. Hot, hot for teacher, yeah. So. Oh. I, I don't feel tardy. I, <laughs> I don't feel saved. Yeah, well, go, don't go by your feelings. Yeah, you know, go by what the what the what the word says. Listen, uh, yeah, I'm uh, a little late and uh, felt pretty stupid trying to get on. So I have to just get one more thing to get. Okay. No problem. No problem. That, that I think is probably appropriate me appropriate for me to wear for the rest of your program. So this is my this is my dunce hat. <laughs> oh, brother, come on. We're, Actually, we're, not, we're, not very, we're not judgmental. We're not going to judge you for being late. It's all right. Actually, it's a handbag. <laughs> <laughs> they perform exorcisms with. Yeah. Come out of them. Well, you know, they're saying it's better late than not at all. So I'm glad you could make it. Uh, um, Brother Mitch uh, was uh, having a little difficulty getting his technology to work, and he got it working. And so I've got uh, uh, Mitchell, and Tanya's here too. Uh, hey, Mitch. God How bless you. I'm looking forward to talking to you one-on-one. You know, -on -one. I've liked your videos for a long time. Great. And, and I seem to recall, I think we might have uh, exchanged emails. Did you have another channel back east that you wore a... Kind of a black kind of hat. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that was me. I yeah, and I remember uh, putting links uh, to you because uh, I I thought uh, you know people who kind of uh, tolerated me and my personality would find yours intriguing and enlightening too. <laughs> <laughs> well, my teacher used to tell me my my it was my drafting teacher, Mr. Lukinov, and he said, "You're not late. We're early." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, let me say something before we get back into the study here, just in case something happens. Uh, the, the last show that we did, uh, for some reason, uh, all of a sudden, I lost the connection. And if that happens again, I want, I want you to do is just go to your Google Plus page, and what I'll do is I'll immediately start a brand new hang-up, and we'll pick up where we left off. And, and then all you got to do is click on that, and if that doesn't work, I'll send you the link to your email the way I did, too. But in other words, if we do get uh, cut off here for some reason, uh, then uh, we'll just re try to restart it as quickly as possible. But uh, be before we go farther in the study, let me introduce uh, anybody who's watching this now. Uh, the, the one who just joined us is uh, Brother Scott Evans. And uh, he, I'm so glad that he was able to not only join us today, but I'm hopeful that uh, you know he'll be a uh, uh, regular part of our discussion groups here. But, um, Brother Scott, could you just tell everybody, just take like maybe 30 seconds or a minute to tell them about your channel and what, you're, what you want to do? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a component of, uh, of aging and I just turned 60 and uh, the memory starts to fade. Or, or it, actually, the memory remains intact. It's just the focus of, your, of, of what you remember changes. I, I can vi remember vividly what Nancy Jolly used to uh, wear uh, in our first grade classroom, but uh, what I had for breakfast, clueless. I, I don't, even, I can't remember. So, it's, so uh, I, I, what's happening? I think uh, as I get older, and I, 
and, and you, you sort of realize that it's not about you. You know, you have kids and things like that. Uh, you, and with the gospel, I think it's the same thing. You start to discover that it's not about you. It's a very minor role you have. You cross the stage and you say, um, or you don't even have to say, but in your heart you say, I, I believe in Christ. And, and so I make, I make it simple. I want to try to stress that and try to put it in parlance that people understand and be cognizant of the fact that a lot of the terminology that we use as Christians, uh, the world that really doesn't understand. You say sanctification or uh, you know, righteousness, and they honestly, truly do not know uh, what, what that means. They, they have a misconception of what it means. You know, if somebody's a righteous dude after listening to Steely Dan, it's like, uh, that's, you know, biblically, it's, it's the more correct terminology. You have right standing predicated upon a legal judicial action that uh, you had nothing to do with. As a matter of fact, you were even in the courtroom when this was determined 2,000 years ago. But the verdict was written down in, in John, I believe, that, you know, three things have happened. And the Holy Spirit is going to be here to remind you of those things. He's going to convict sinners of their need to uh, have a Savior. And uh, for those of us who believe in Christ, he's going to convince us uh, of our righteousness because we have a tendency, and the devil will sometimes prey upon that to get us focused on ourselves, and we start doubting uh, our worth and value, and the Holy Spirit will gently remind you that it's not your righteousness, and and that's why it's imperative to know, you know what Jesus did and keep the focus on him. And as far as the devil, that was the third part of the verdict, is that he's condemned already, and uh, his destination is the lake of fire. So that's uh, I just want to try to keep it simple. Unlike what I just told you, I, I went over 30, over 30 seconds, and people are like, what the? Well, some of, some of the people who are going to view this, uh, either the live stream now or when it gets uploaded on YouTube, some of the people are probably familiar, familiar with Scott already and, and Mitchell and, and Tanya. But I, I can say this, that I have a, a litmus test for someone to be in my discussion groups. Uh, the, the test is really simple. You just have to be a pure grace believer and, and, and be able to say, um, uh, not, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We, we depend completely on Jesus and what he did. We're not boasting anything about what we do for our salvation. It, it, the, bur the burden for our salvation was all on Jesus Christ. There's no burden on us. We just trust him. So if you see someone in, on this panel tonight, today, or any time in the future, you can rest assured that we share this common belief that nothing is required except trust in the Savior completely. Uh, and... Uh, and we may t discuss all kinds of other theological questions, and we may disagree sometimes, and sometimes maybe a, a 180 disagreement, sometimes a subtle, a nuanced disagreement, but I guarantee you we do all agree on this one fundamental truth, that we're saved by faith alone, Christ alone. Yes. Yes. Now, what we're, what we're trying to do in this study here is we've been working our way through the scriptures in the Old Testament and showing how all through the Old Testament, it, uh, it was showing this future death of Jesus on the cross for our sins in all kinds of ways. And right now we've reached the point where we're talking about uh, things like we just discussed the tabernacle, the bronze altar, the basin labor, the showbread, uh, the lamp stand, the altar of incense. And um, so that's where we are right now, Scott. And we're going to move on now to this... Uh, uh, the the curtain the curtain is the next thing that we want to discuss. We already mentioned it just a little bit earlier, but um, in the temple and in the uh, in the tabernacle, uh, there was a curtain that uh, no one could pass go past except for the high priest once a year. So, do you want to say anything about what that curtain represented? Anybody? Or is this for... Yeah, yeah you go ahead, because uh, Mitch and I already... Commented. We've already we've already put our two cents in enough. We need to hear somebody else. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I really hate to admit this, but I, I'm woefully uh, uh, inadequate to, to really kind of offer any sort of uh, anything other than a rudimentary understanding of the Old Testament. I was... Cause I, when I, the Lord called me when I was in my 20s, and uh, I guess it, I think it intimidated me quite a bit because I had no religious upbringing. 
I didn't. I honestly could not tell you the difference between Moses and Jesus. I didn't understand. I was that blind, spiritually blind. So I was uh, very intimidated, and uh, I, I didn't study it uh, out and didn't find it fascinating, but found it. You know, it was in fear, and so I kind of. Uh, uh, I just. I, 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 I don't know. Is you, actually, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Now, this when they went in to uh, behind the veil to do their business, the, the Levites, right? You know, the, and to minister the atonement to all. And if they got it right, then they were all right for a year. But if they got it wrong, then there were problems. Was it was it that strict of an adherence? I'm not sure exactly what they did behind that veil, or maybe Mitch will, will know. Um, and one other, one other thing, Mitch, do you, is there anything in the Old Testament about did they did they tie a bell to their foot so that they would and they would shake it, or they had a bell to let the people on the other side of the veil know that they were okay? That it was still alive, and they put a rope around the guy. But but the I think the curtain itself. I wonder what color they picked out. I know my wife would have probably picked out a nice color. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, well, and, and probably, but, probably, you know, because that, that part of the store I never go to where they have the curtains, you know. And, I don't and know where that is, but and they didn't have vinyl. But so somehow or another, my yeah. wife finds it and, and and she drags me in there, and I'm like, uh, is this really a part of the world? But I think that the curtain, the curtain is like, to me, the the mountain, the holy mountain of fire. You see, nobody could approach the holy mountain. As a matter of fact, I would put flames on the curtain, you know, because I would say say that the, the curtain is the, the is is a forbidden. If anybody crosses or tries to get onto the holy mountain, they will be burned up and consumed. The only one that could go in was was Moses, and Moses had prophesied about a, a, a the Messiah, Jesus, or a prophet to come that would be like me, that would be able to intercede for us. So when the curtain was, when Jesus came and tore that cur curtain in two, he he made a way for people to get to heaven through the holy mountain. That 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 because remember the Jews were afraid they couldn't. You can't touch the mountain of the law. The the uh, the law. So in my mind, the curtain is the is the wall of fire, if you will, the holy mountain. That that's what it looks like to me. Okay. And and did they not say it? I I I get bits and pieces. I found in a rice. Didn't they say you you go talk to him? We don't want to talk to him because yeah, basically they were afraid. They, 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 yeah. they, you know, so they, they they said Moses, you you go in, you go between us. So when Moses said a prophet like me, he he was speaking a prophet like me that would be able to intercede, and the only prophet to come like that, all the rest of the prophets prophesied about about the coming Messiah, but the only prophet that interceded for them had to have been Jesus Christ because he is the one. That, that died for their sins, or died, you know, or, or, or made a way for that holy mountain to be parted, so that people can 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 get into the into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I, unfortunately, uh, due to age and the, the fear factor, which was definitely there, you know, when you read these stories, until you, I think, until you ask the right questions from somebody who has the right answers, uh, and I, I was doing that continually in my twenties. Uh, it was trying to reconcile this uh, this God with the, the God of the New Testament. I think that's a common plight of young Christians because they seem so diametrically opposed. But if you start getting the right answers from somebody who really has insight, they start, they explain that it was it was just a communication breakdown. So the way I look at it is the war is being waged on two fronts. God's taking back the heavens that was usurped from Him. And he's taking back the earth that was usurped from him, and legally and justifiably so. So uh, he he operated in different ways, and, and and some of those ways seem strange. But it's almost like I mean, if you flip it and think, uh, you know, it's not we that should have been afraid of him. It's actually him <laughs> being afraid of us getting in in our present condition and. Creating the same problem there that has been created here. I mean, the, the, like the Babel stories. Like, well, well, isn't God for the human race? I mean, why would He disperse these people and give them different tongues and set them back all these years when they were doing so well? They were building this tower and this. It's like, but but the problem really was is that if, 
you kept allowing human beings to unite and do those things without God, they, it creates an illusion that's false and a big lie that they don't need God, and they'll never be seeking Him out. Well, there is there is the sin in the garden, though, isn't it? That you don't need God. You don't need Him. For the minute you eat of that fruit, you'll be like Him, knowing good and evil. Yeah. So, same lie repackaged for it's, each it's uh, exactly generation. A, exactly. Yeah. Hey, uh, Brother Scott, uh, uh, I'm not criticizing anything you just said, but I want to advise you to uh, refocus your camera so that your face is higher up and it only gets you in the top of your head. And maybe okay. put a little more light, a little more light uh, in your room, just if you have a lamp or something, because it's very, you have a very dark picture of yourself. I'm, yeah, I'm using this. <laughs> I, told, I told you Mim was making uh, household improvements. You have oil. And you have she, oil for your lamp? She, no, I'm, she makes, and she's really great at this. She, I mean, she sees and does things that I would never think of doing, and she's really done wonders with this place in a short amount of time. But she bought this, and she's always buying She's not here. <laughs> She's buying these things. Now, this is actually a fan uh, and a light. And the light, now, I don't know why, but is you can have it plain or you can have it flash for some reason. You know, like that. <laughs> or, or if it gets really out of hand, it'll do an SOS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're... Reminds me of the 80s, actually. So, so we're wondering about the veil and stuff. It's like, maybe we should answer this question first, which seems a lot tougher. Why? Why would she get this? Hang on, let me turn Well, we just talked about the candlesticks, so maybe that was relevant to that. <laughs> the, okay, so let me, let me kind of sum this up on the veil, and then we'll move on to the next uh, okay. thing. And, uh, the, the, the veil was a separation uh, representing... Uh, separation between the people and God. And once a year, the priest was allowed to go underneath that veil uh, to accomplish this atonement for, for their sins for the year. Uh, and it's true that they would tie a rope to him in case he was killed, they have to drag him out. But I don't know of any example when any of them were actually killed. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the reason this is important in, is that we're looking at the Old Testament, comparing it to what we see in the New Testament. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was split in two, and that is symbolic of the barrier this, this veil represented between man and God was split open and barriers removed. And the barrier that we had was sin, because, because of sin, uh, man was uh, separated from God, because Jesus paid for our sins, the bar sin barrier was broken open, and now man is free to commune with God and come to God and uh, and we're all everybody is free to do that now and we can go to him through Jesus Christ to receive eternal life now so the veil in the Old Testament uh, and then what happened to that veil when Jesus died is that picture of that atonement uh, someone was asking about the color of the veil it says it was blue purple and scarlet yarn and, and it was supposed to represent uh, the heavens, the kingship of God. See, the, the blue is, would represent the heavens. The purple is a royal color. It represents the kingship of God. And then uh, the scarlet, it represents the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I was going to say, the color schematic there almost seems like uh, you know the end there with the, the robe on and the mocking and everything else. I don't know what color the robe he was wearing, but... The purple is like royalty, like in every sort of culture. It hasn't been, I think. I don't know. But uh, all right, we'll move on and talk about the Ark of the Covenant now. The Ark of the Covenant. What, what was it? What was this Ark? We talked about Noah's Ark. Some people who don't study the Bible don't know that there's a, a Noah's Ark, and then there's the Ark of the Covenant. These are not the same thing. Hang on, I'm looking it up now. <laughs> Mitch, uh, Mitch, go ahead with that one. I... <laughs> with the Ark of the Covenant, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to know. Um, well, I know that the the uh, the law was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. I'd like to know what it was painted with on the outside. But then you had the mercy seat, which was was the mercy seat on on top of the Ark, and um, and so. Um, 
And I know the law was placed in the ark. So that was the that was the um, actually the the vehicle that carried carried the ark, and the people would carry the ark in front of them, and um, anywhere the ark went, you know, they had victory. But realize if anybody touched that ark, they were destroyed. They were struck down. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the ark contained the law and the presence of God. So um, and so I would say, I, in my opinion, the, the, ark, the ark pretty much it represents uh, the holiness of God. Yeah. Um, I would say it represents, the, obviously, the holiness. But, uh, you can't separate holiness from God. But it really is representative of the, the presence of God with the people, much like the, the, the tabernacle. Uh, the ark itself uh, contained, I believe, uh, the, uh, some, of the, uh, um, some of the manna from heaven that was saved. It contained the Ten Commandments uh, tablets, and it contained uh, uh, the rod, the staff, that uh, budded. The budded, the, the budded that Moses had in it, it, can, the dead staff that, that created buds came to life on it. Can you do? Can you run that three, three things? Can you run it one more time? It got kind of distorted in the middle. I wanted it. Yeah. Now I don't know how the staff could fit in there, so maybe I'm wrong. But I thought that the it contained the I'm staff. Sure it contained the staff. What's no, that? It was his rod. The rod, the yeah. Ten Commandments, and then also some manna. Okay. What was the purpose of putting the manna in there? Just to well, the manna, of course, is a likeness to to Jesus, who is the bread of life, and okay. the manna represented life because in the wilderness they didn't have food. So uh, we discussed in a previous show how uh, God provided them uh, flesh with the quails, and God provided us flesh, Jesus is a body being sacrificed. God provided. The, the, the Jews in the wilderness bread, the manna, and Jesus provides us himself as the bread of life. And God provided the, the Jews water, and Moses struck the rock, and water came out. It was symbolic of Jesus being the rock of our salvation, being struck in the ribs, and water coming out. And That's he, right. And, the he, living, and, living the, water. and the, the problem was that you, you strike him once, and Moses didn't. And, and, and so I'm wondering if God was uh, angry or disappointed uh, in Moses maybe losing his temper or more disappointed in the fact that he knew this is the depiction of the spear on the side once and the water comes yeah. out. Yeah, we, uh, last episode we went into this in more detail, but, but basically uh, Salam uh, corrected me the way I presented it, and I think it, it sheds some more light on it. Uh, there's two examples of Moses uh, striking the rock and getting water out. The first time, uh, God told Moses, strike the rock and water will come out. He did it. On a later occasion, he told Moses to just tell the rock to give water. But wrote, Moses didn't tell it, speak to the rock, he struck it. And, and because he struck it, it shows that he tried to do it himself instead of just doing what God said and having faith. So because Moses didn't have faith and followed God's instructions correctly, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. Joshua had to bring them. Yeah. But I think that this, the striking of the one-time strike was the, uh, the picture God wants us to have of the one time Jesus was struck in the ribs and, and, and the water, blood, uh, water with blood flowed out. And uh, God didn't want that illustration, that shadow of, of a, this future uh, situation with Jesus. He didn't want that um, messed up. And, jo and Moses messed it up by striking the rock again. Question here. Yes. That staff budded, did it not? Yes. Now, if you were to strike a rock and living water would come out, would that cause something like the tree of life to bud? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like, like like we have a picture of, of, a, of a staff in there. If we're saying that it was the, the, the rod that struck the rock, which is the cross, basically. Mm -hmm. the, the cross struck Jesus Christ. And then 
went forth and budded, would that have a picture of the tree? Of, would that be a picture of the tree of life, Jesus Christ? Yes. Yeah, we discussed in the first uh, uh, show uh, something Mitch had talked about in some of his videos in the past is that the in the garden, the tree of life was symbolic of Jesus Christ, uh, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was symbolic of the law. Uh, the knowledge of good and evil is like the knowledge of the law. The law is our schoolmaster to teach us you know, uh, what's right and wrong and show us that we, we are incapable of of being doing right all the time. So the, the tree of life is is represents Jesus being on that tree, dying for our sins and giving us eternal life through that act. Uh, but I see the rod, um, it just came to me, the rod was not uh, planted in the ground, it wasn't growing, it was just a stick that obviously was dead, and yet life came out of it to me, that would be a picture of the resurrection. It's dead, now it's alive again. Uh, let's, uh, okay, the, the mercy seat. Uh, what does the mercy seat uh, equate to? This is interesting. I don't know if I... I'm, I'm sure it, it quest, uh, nothing is coming to mind immediately, because, but I think I have a, you were saying the other night on the phone, if you uh, go into a piece of scripture and you have a preconceived uh, um, a notion or idea based on what you've been previously taught, what was the, what was the term, the biblical term? That, it's a, I, said, I said Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the other one? The opposite. Exegesis. Exegesis. So, so you basically want to have exegesis. You don't want to have. You want to go in with clean, a clean slate so that you could possibly. Well, I've always. Uh, I just talked about that recently. I don't know if it was in a conversation with someone or on a video. I know. I think the last episode of the show I, I did uh, uh, talking about that point, and that I've always been taught that exegesis is the correct way to learn the Bible. You read the Bible and you take out of it what the Bible says. You don't read anything into it. That's exegesis. Yeah, it let, let, let it speak for itself. Yeah, I said Jesus is you come there with a preconceived idea and you read it through that lens. I always thought that was wrong until I started this study. And now I'm, I've come to the conclusion that we have to come to the Bible with, uh, or at least the Old Testament, we need to come to it with a uh, already uh, a preconceived notion, a, a conclusion, an established uh, principle, and that is salvation. Uh, is accomplished because Jesus died for our sins and he gives us eternal life as a gift. But once we once we say, okay, let's look at everything through that lens, that's eisegesis. Let's look at the Old Testament now, but let's let's interpret it through that lens. Uh, now some people say, well you can't do that. You've got to just read it. But if but by us looking back at it at the Old Testament and saying, look, this is an example of Jesus' rib rib of Body being smitten with a spear, this rock. Now we wouldn't, if we didn't study the New Testament and look back and look at it from that perspective, we would not be able to understand the symbology of this. Yes. So to, to get back to your question, how it applies here, and what and with the preconceived sort of ideas that I've developed uh, that kind of prevent me from maybe seeing this, or I don't, but I know, I mean, I'm sure it applies to something. But the problem I have is. Uh, is and it's not a problem. It's actually really good. I think if you when you start to understand and embrace it, is that is there. We often think of you know, uh, pray for God's mercy and His grace to prevail. It's like, and actually the truth is, if you look in common, if you look in English and you look both the words up, they're different. They're and they're markedly different. So and other so pray for one or the other and make sure you're understanding. Uh, uh, which which you're asking for and which you need and what he's doing now, okay? Because it's it's all mercy, uh, it's it's all uh, his mer love and his mercy endureth forever. It's all mercy, mercy, mercy in the Old Testament all the way until you get to uh, Acts and you learn about the Barnabas coming back from uh, the mission field, and uh, that's the first time in the Bible that you hear the phrase the grace of God. Oh, no, it's the second time. The first time you hear it is in Luke, the first chapter, 
at where it's talking about the genealogy and who's giving birth to whom. And the, and the child, Jesus, grew strong in spirit, and the grace of God was upon him. So, if mercy is a matter of, uh, you know, you did something to me, Luke, and I'm really ticked off about it, and we got unfinished business. You know, and I, and I seek you out. And then when I get to you, I go, uh, you know, I've, I'm going to have mercy on you. You get, you've got this coming, and you know you've got this coming, but I'm going to be merciful to you. Whereas grace, being unmerited favor, and Christ uh, having uh, buried the sins where they are forgotten, and prior to that, the sins were taken care of, and it was by faith, but the faith pr produced a different result. God would remove them as far as east is from west and not remember them anymore, put them under the blood, but it's like, you know, it's a progression, and it's a war, and it's an advancement. And when Christ came and lived uh, a perfect life and empathized, with every, and empathized with everything we go through because he was tempted in every way, the perfect lamb sacrifice, when that was done, and legally God had a right to, uh, look, you know, the sins went on him, and I'm not remembering him anymore because I am fair, <laughs> you know. And uh, fairness, you know, so if you've been tried once, and one died, all died, you've been tried, sins were on him, and he's not going to retry you again. So he can actually employ grace, which is a much better deal, and the devil likes to keep you in darkness about that, because uh, if he can get you back on doing one little thing that's contingent upon you, then he can start, uh, you know, kind of encouraging you initially, and then telling you you're failing, and then all of a sudden he's, uh, you know, in your ear 24-7 going, yeah, maybe it's all done. You know, maybe you failed God too many times this time. But the, the truth is, you can't fail him because he required nothing from you to to, be, to, to yeah. believe in it. Yeah. But when I was preparing the kind of the notes for this study, it, it took me uh, like a week, a lot of work to do it. But what what this particular person in their notes, they they compared the mercy seat to our grace. But I'm not necessarily buying into that. Uh, because the mercy, to me, most people I've encountered uh, think of mercy and grace as interchangeable terms. But are they really? Uh, I, I, I put forth that mercy and grace are antonyms, not synonyms, but antonyms. Now, if you want to, anybody wants to say anything before I define it, go ahead and say it. Otherwise, I'll define what I mean by that. Go ahead. Define what you mean by that. Okay. <coughs> mercy, uh, if, if I was going to just like give you the simplest ver uh, definition, mercy is you're supposed to get something bad and you don't get it. In other words, you're supposed to, let's say, be, get the electric chair and they give you mercy. Something bad is supposed to happen and you don't get it. You're spared. Grace is the, not the same thing. It's opposite. Grace is you're not supposed to get something good, and yet they give it to you. You don't deserve this good thing, and yet they give it to you. So mercy is you're not getting what you deserve, the bad thing you deserve, and grace is you you are getting the good thing that you don't deserve. Yeah, and it, and and not only that, the good things that you do receive. Um, uh, you can you get in a progression that get, goes from that was really great what the Lord did for me. That was more amazing what the Lord did for me. The, and it's the best wine uh, is served last with Him. Yeah, it, ju it just if you're expecting uh, love from God, uh, you're you kind of fail. You it's love and then more love and expect more love, <laughs> and to which there is no end because He loves perfectly and He's infinite. So Paul could say you're never going to understand the depths, either width of his love, which we you need eternity for that. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it makes me um, uh, very happy <laughs> when I start thinking about those things. <laughs> if, if, if we take the name of this, it is literally named the mercy seat. Um, so if, if what I'm saying is correct, and if, if you think I'm wrong, t tell me I'm wrong about this. If mercy and grace are opposite concepts, then then we can't really think of the mercy seat as being grace, because mercy and grace are 
opposite concepts. I don't think they're opposite concepts. Is that I, well, I, you walked away when I was explaining this, so I, you either didn't hear that or or no, you, I, I, I heard you. I, I, I had the volume up. I just needed it. Okay. So, if, if, in other words, mercy is uh, you you do not get what you deserve, which is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Grace is uh, you do you you do get what you don't deserve, which is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So, well, let me ask let me ask you this. I mean, would you agree with this? Because I, I, I agree with what you just said, but uh, the change was uh, was uh, went into effect not because of anything we did. Uh, in, other, in other words, the war and the fight, uh, of, which seems to be have been going on and raging for a long time, we're told in the heavens and on earth, the dividing line goes between every man, woman, and child. You're kind of you 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 brought to a point where do I believe or do I not believe? I'm going to go this way or I'm going to go that way. So it's, there's a fight going on for souls. Uh, so at what point, um, when, when it shifted, and it clearly shifts. I mean, this is a, an astounding shift. I mean, Paul uses the word mercy, but I'm literally uh, maybe a half to a dozen times in 13 epistles, whereas grace of God is peppered throughout those, throughout the end, you know, the latter chapter of Acts, and through uh, all all the Pauline epistles, so but but when that did that change occur because of uh, the human race on whole as having learned some things and improved and gotten better, or was it something that God did and was entitled to do because of the act of His Son mm -hmm. at the cross? Well, I think that mercy, mercy, and grace are both things that we desire. We want to be given mercy. We want to be given grace. But when we're given mercy, that means we're being spared some punishment. But when we're being given grace, that means we get some reward, some benefit that we didn't earn. Yeah. So, uh, so, but they're both desirable, and, and God is, loves us so much, he gives us mercy and grace. Yeah. But I'm just making the point that, to me, uh, as I just defined them, uh, I won't repeat it again, but it seems to me they're kind of like opposing ideas, even though they're both desirable we want to have mercy and grace. Mitch, what do you think about that? Well, I want to know, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? It's a tomato. A tomato. Is a tomato, is a tomato a fruit or is it a vegetable? We semantics with Brother Luke. It's a fruit. It's a fruit. <laughs> what I'm saying okay. here is that, yes, okay, mercy is, is something that... You know, if, if 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 you're at the mercy of somebody's mercy and and they're good enough to spare you, then it's mercy. But grace is unmerited favor. Is grace merciful? Yes, grace is merciful, especially if you are a sinner. But my idea here about grace goes beyond just being spared. Say I'm I, I I'm at war and I have my enemy. And I let my enemy go. That's an act of compassion. But I'll never see my enemy again. But what if I was to say to that enemy, not only that, come to my house and live and fellowship with me. Be my friend. Now yeah. that's different. Yeah. That's relational. Yeah, the old, you know, we're not serving, we're not serving God today. We're co-laborers with him. And great, great, and great. And, and the audacity to say that Jesus is now our brother, co co heir. Family. <laughs> there's a there's a difference between having mercy and then adopting somebody. Yeah. And and I think that that that's the contrast I kind of want to draw. Well, I think that each one of us, uh, it's kind of a two step process. We receive mercy. We're spared the lake of fire. And we also then and then we see we we receive grace we receive eternal life in the kingdom of God so we receive mercy then grace but well, uh, not just in the kingdom we have fellowship with Christ he's our friend he's you know it's relational otherwise we wouldn't have to grow in truth and grace grace is very hard to understand it runs totally counter to everything that this world teaches you from a very early stage. It's like if I'm good, then teachers are going to give me a gold star. If I'm good, I'm, if I'm bad. Things are going. To, 
And then grace, like, throws all of that out the window. I mean, as a matter of fact, we'll create disappointment if you if you fall under the false impression that if, I, you know, if I tithe and I do this and, you know, God's, in, you know, then he's going to be, bless me. It's like, he's not obligated to do that. He, he's going to bless you because of who he is, and then he may not because he knows what's best for us at all times. So it's... Uh, uh, at, at what you said, I agree with 100%. I think it's as the book is a trans trans uh, narrative and it's a progressive revealing of, of God's advancement into this world. And I think it's individually it's the same way. When you first get saved, I think you you're under a you are for the first time in a, in moment aware of the crushing weight of sin. That all the stuff you don't maybe remember everything, but you remember enough and you feel the weight. And you've gotten used to it because you've carried it all this time. And then when you finally turn and believe that Christ died for your sins, that he's up there, he's risen, and he can hear you. And it's like, and all of a sudden that, I've heard people say this, and you have too, that weight came off of me. You know, so it, initially I think you're experiencing mercy. But the truth is, is that uh, none of those sins and the guilt and the repercussions of those and how you feel, none of those were going to be sending you to hell. It was just that your, your your ignorance of the fact that the, your problem has been taken care of. And I, I agree with your point that the this whole idea of grace uh, it just befuddles most people. Uh, most professing Christians uh, they don't appreciate grace the way that uh, I think that we have learned to appreciate it and say uh, grace is amazing. It is that's the most perfect way of putting it. It is amazing that God would be so gracious to us. Uh, but I'm looking, when we compare the Old Testament and the New here, and this blood in the Old and the blood in the New, uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's a reason that they had a mercy seat, but they didn't have a grace seat. Because some of these things, they were... Uh, they, they didn't really clearly understand what exactly was going to happen. It was all these pictures and shadows and types and stuff, and uh, they, they could easily understand what mercy is. But mm -hmm. for them to comprehend that God's going to be gracious on top of it, he's not only going to be merciful, but he's going to be gracious and make you a child of God with eternal life. Um, maybe that's why they, they just didn't couldn't understand grace, because there was no grace to you. There was only a mercy. Well, one thing that immediately leaps to mind is I, I remember years ago hearing somebody say, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if, you know, and, and we're, we get back to this age of, of miracles and it's going to happen if we just believe and have enough faith and God will be speaking and feeding and, and you know, and, and, and people will be hearing him. And, and, and they were talking in terms of the Old Testament, actually hearing an audible voice and seeing these signs and stuff. And I started thinking, you know, would that really be so great? Because this is what this is what the children uh, were were seeing, you know, in the wilderness, and they were seeing the results of disobedience, I mean, many being struck dead in one day. So, so they, yeah, they had a definite awareness of uh, of what God could do if they were disobedient, and they, uh, they so they definitely understood the mercy thing. And and I think, I think, I think. Uh, I, I think Satan's behind it. I think he he would he loves to have people get it mixed up, mercy and grace. And it's it because look, if you start believing in mercy and you believe and and you start hearing somebody say God's punishing Japan for this and that with this, uh, uh, an earthquake or whatever, uh, well, it doesn't add up scripturally. If all the sins were taken away and he's not imputing sins against anybody, it means that you know it's it's the wholeness. One died, all died. Okay. Not, it, the sin is not the issue anymore. So it is definitely grace, but if you start thinking that it might be mercy, then you start looking and go, well, this guy's a Christian, and I heard that he embezzled, or I heard that he cheated on his wife or something. You know, it's like, you know, shouldn't there be some sort of retribution to teach him a lesson? It's like, uh, no, because God's not going to go against his word. Yeah. He's not, he's, not, he's not seeing that, and, it, and the man doesn't have to confess it, uh, to be forgiven, because that's not how we're forgiven. We're forgiven by believing, by believing what's already been done. And and like again, the the faith uh, 
preachers of the 80s on TBN made a fortune by convincing people that if they just had enough faith and if they minded their P's and Q's that they were going to prosper. And uh, it took me about, I don't know, a day and a half to kind of realize that uh, a lot, most, all of my Christian friends who I, I thought were basically really pretty nice people and loved God and tried to live for God, uh, they were uh, eating lima beans. I was for about seven or eight years when I, didn't, I couldn't book an acting job. So, you know, where was the provision? Well, we're, we never we weren't promised a provision. We were promised. We were what we're promised is that uh, to those who love God and are called according to His purpose, which is uh, grace, and to have men know the truth, that uh, all things, good things, bad things, the things that just happen in life because you're human and in a fallen world, that God will take even the bad things uh, and uh, and work them, you know, work them out. So I had a young man. Uh, attend my Bible study at my house years ago, and he was uh, adamant to make the point that, um, that Christians are, should be really blessed all the time. He said, uh, he said, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly. In other words, he was trying to make the point that if you're a Christian, you should have an abundance of blessings in your life all the time. That's the sign that you're a Christian. You're being blessed with this abundant life. And I asked him about the Apostle Paul about the abundance of his life. Yeah. He had, he had an abundance of things. But yeah. he had I need to check my lottery ticket. Hold on a second. I was praying <laughs> on it. Wait a minute. Let's see if God blessed me in abundance here. <laughs> oh. Yeah. All right. So, so Mitch, I get uh, next week? <laughs> Mitch uh, if we talk about uh, to give life more abundantly, how would you describe Paul, the Apostle Paul's life, everything that he went through as an abundant life? Well, he gave me abundantly a lot more trouble, but but what did he give me in abundance? <laughs> he gave me a faith and a hope in something that licks mercy hollow. Amen. He gave ah. me something. He gave me something to hope in that has nothing to do with me, but has to do with his love for me. He, he gave me something that I, that I can hold in my hand. And, and what do I hold in my hand? Him holding me in, my, in, in his hand. He's got me. I don't have him. <laughs> That's what yeah. he gave me. Yeah. I and life more abundantly because in that I can rejoice. Everything else in this world can fall apart. But I know I have heaven. By the grace, yeah. mercy, and love that my personal God has for me. Well, I think Paul. Uh, I uh, go ahead, brother. Hmm? Scott, go ahead. Pardon me. Uh, you were about to say something, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah, two points that I wanted to make is from from the Word. If you look at Ephesians, and here's here's what Paul says, and this is what I think he's. This is the abundant life he's speaking of. Okay, um, he says. Uh, um, uh, I just had it here. It's the, it's the, oh, blessed, verse 3, chapter 1, Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.24, he says, uh, um, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, the result now being, uh, are dead to sins because Jesus took them along because God's not you know imputing them, so that we can now live live unto righteousness. That that no matter ups and downs, whatever you're doing, whichever you you're doing willfully and it planned out and or whatever, just sort of get you get waylaid by and it, you realize that it's not pleasing to God and certainly not even pleasing to yourself or friends or family, but you're you still live unto righteousness because he bore those and by whose stripes you were healed. Now a lot of folks have taken that and made a fortune with it uh, saying that you know he was crushed and uh, that by his stripes were healed so just claim that but there is the, the, he's, that's not a claim to, for physical healing. It's, it's telling you that by his stripes you're spiritually healed and Paul says that you're seated in heavenly realms already with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So 
that's uh, that's a distinction that I think people would benefit from understanding, because uh, look, you know, he sometimes he heals miraculously, but more often than not, he doesn't, for whatever his reasons are. But but uh, that's and when you walk by faith and not by sight and really understand what you've been given, it, 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 look, it's beyond our finite mind to grasp that that you are literally going to leave this world of woes. You're already spiritually seated in heavenly realms. You're going to be given a new body to be in those heavenly realms. You are going to be a co-heir already and with him. And it's, you're, you're being risen to a place that your mind can't fathom. And when it becomes a reality and you're out of the body and before Christ, you, uh, I mean, the more you can understand his grace and what he's already done, and, and what is already uh, in your possession because he's purchased you, uh, it, you, you, I think you then begin to live the Christian life with great joy, and it's like you've got so much, you, you, you understand his love, in, incomprehensible, unfathomable love for you. What, is, what, are, what are you that he's mindful of you, not only mindful, but has given you all these undeserved things that you can't help, at least I can, I don't want to brag, but it's like, I used to be a chore sometimes for me to be loving on certain. It's like not not that way that because I see I see any person who doesn't know this I see them as they're there you're there too you have, you do have a new identity all you have to do is say yeah I believe who I am and by what he says about me here in his word and not by how I feel and what I've done and you know kicking you know toe on the carb and going oh I'm so I'm a worthless sinner. That's mock humility. Real humility is going, I'm going to forget about what I think about myself. It's actually of no import. I'm going to instead believe what it says here about who I am in Christ. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I... Go ahead, Mitch. Mitch, where do you... Uh, I have decided to live like a believer, turn my back on the deceiver. Right? Andy Grant. Andy Grant. I decided that being good is... Is, is just a fable. I can uh, I cannot. I am not able. Gonna live what I believe. Amy Grant. Yeah, absolutely. One of my one of my wife's my favorites. My long departed wife was uh, having a great time and laughing at me. <laughs> Going, you know, see, I found a better apartment than you first in L.A. I found a better job than you first in L.A. And I've gone to heaven 22 years before you. She's always leading the way. I'm taking behind us what I was doing. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good song and how true. Uh, I think that the uh, we, we discussed this in an earlier study about the uh, in, is the Jews uh, how they were it was all about getting physical blessings. They, they they were blessed to get their freedom from Egypt. They were blessed to be spared being killed, uh, and, and they made it through the Red Sea. They, were, they received a physical blessing to receive manna from heaven and quail and water. And then they receive a physical blessing where they get finally into the promised land and they have the promised land. It's all physical blessings. Uh, whereas uh, for us, it's all about the spiritual blessing. You know, this is not our home. This is not our we're citizens of heaven. It's a spiritual kingdom. We're going to have glorified bodies eventually, but it's not about this 80-year period in our life. The purpose of this 80 years is to become regenerated as a child of God and then grow and mature and, and be prepared for his eternal use of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, So, you know, we, it's all about building up treasures in heaven rather than, than uh, trying to acquire blessings, physical blessings in this world. Yep. So that, that's the huge, huge difference. Um, hey, Tanya, welcome back. Hey, Tanya. Good to see you. How are you feeling? Hello. How's the baby? Doing good. Yeah. He's grown like a weed already. <laughs> okay. Um, you haven't been, had a chance to talk much. Anything you want to say about anything be, uh, before we move on? You've got a lot of uh, uh, acquired, uh, accumulated words to come out. No, not too much this time. Just listening. All right, then. I'm going to move on to let's discuss the priests at uh, the temple here. Uh, the, the priests uh, all wore plain white garments uh, when they served at the, the sanctuary. So, 
what what is is there anything significant about the priest wearing all white garments? We're looking at Old Testament, comparing it to something, uh, a picture of something in the New Testament. Hmm. I always spill coffee and, and food all over my. If I go wear a white shirt when I'm out, I always get it stained here and there. So I never wear white. <laughs> With but never will have it, right? You know, yes, every uh, time. <laughs> we'll always be white as we're, we're washed white as snow by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> and so you know, priests are, 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 are an image of, of 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 I think the white garments that have to be have to be an image of being washed white as snow, or the or the holiness of Christ Himself. Yeah, well, the their garments. Uh, there's also in the New Testament talking about white garments too. Really? Yeah. Deep without uh, blemish. Uh, let's say, let's go to Revelation 7, 13, 14. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, and it, it also says, uh, uh, Then one of the elders asked me, Those in white robes, uh, who are they? Where did they come from? And I answered, Sir, you know. So, it's talking about these people who have these white robes, and the white robe is, uh, and another example is when it talks about the, the people who go to the wedding feast, how they have to have this proper garment to wear. And uh, so we try to we try to make our garments white ourselves, you know, through our own labors. You know, people are always trying to bleach the clothes and make it clean and stuff, and work it hard, and, and but it's, it's we can never make it white. As, we, we can only have the snow white garment when Jesus clothes us in it. And it's washed white with his blood. So that's the, uh, the white garment that we have uh, to look forward to. In fact, we, we're wearing it right now. As God looks at us, he sees us in this white garment that's spotless. Can that I Mitch, you don't have to worry about it. No, no spots on your white garment, Mitch. No matter how messy you get. Well, you know, I, I want to get the product out there, lamb's blood, for removing stains and whitening clothes. <laughs> what's, what's next? Marketing specialty products, like Spot removers for Christmas. I, I just want to capitalize <laughs> somehow. Lamb's blood. <laughs> You're a funny guy, man. <laughs> okay, so... We talked about the priests and the white robes. Uh, now let's look. Let's look at Hebrews 4:14. Can I can I throw one thing in quick? I'll be, I promise to be really quick. Okay. You don't, have to, you don't have to be quick. Go ahead. This is this was something my mother-in-law gave me. She was Jewish. Okay, and I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, all white, and it's and it's definition, right? Can you? Yeah. See? Okay. What it is on the bottom? Their hands, and uh, this tree. You know, as as a whole, okay, and and in our tendency to anthropomorphize God, we kind of make him um, kind of like us, to, you know, but a little better, you know, and, and stronger, and smarter, and, but you, you got to realize it's like an entirely different class. You know, there's a chasm that's so huge that Paul said it was ineffable to try to explain what went on, you know, between. So I read. Uh, uh, when I started uh, focusing more on what, uh, what Paul was saying, I, I, and I believe he has the clearest expression of the grace in which we now stand, and, and the illustrations and things like this, he, he says that it's a spiritual body, and we're, we are placed into the body of Christ, and once we're done so, there's no Jew or Gentile or male or female, a slave or free, that uh, God is not seeing those things anymore that we see amongst each other. Then uh, I came across by accident, oh yeah, sure, and it's coincidence, and I think the Lord showed me this. I was reading Genesis, and it's chapter 5, uh, verse 3. Okay, so it says that, uh, there we go. Well, Genesis, that's the first book. Um, Genesis 5. Hang on a second. 
and I found this a huge, a huge blessing. Um, or is it three? Hang on. It says, uh, um, well, I, I remember it from, it's in there. He, he says that in the beginning, he, he made them, you know, made Adam and Eve, he made them male and female, and he called them Adam. And it's like, well, but Eve's there too, <laughs> you know, and her sons were thereafter, and all the way down the line, all the way until you get to Romans, and Paul talks about the first Adam, and because of one man's transgression, sin entered the whole race, but from God's viewpoint, he's not seeing uh, individuals, it's like, well, I'm a really good person, I do the right things. Yeah, but you're still in Adam, and he's seeing you in Adam. And it's, you know, it's a tree, and it's... Uh, it started way back in Genesis. He, you know, he started the human race, and he called them Adam. But then, when Christ overturned and reversed things, then you have the opportunity by His grace and faith to believe, and then you're placed in Christ. Where again, He's not seeing uh, your ups and downs and failures and this thing. He's seeing you as uh, wisdom with wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. And just all these things because you are in Him. It's an exchange. That exchange, and the new identity, all has passed away. All things have become new, including you. And you're given you're given a new name. And so I, I just uh, that's kind of a, I don't know what we were talking about initially, but it does tie into what you were saying. But the in terms of well, the, getting the, the stain out and the priests and I know that Mitch uh, he loves to talk about the name and the different uh, Jewish words. Uh, what do you want to say about Adam? Adam is, Adam is clay. That's it. Adam, Adam is clay. Actually, Adam dirt. <laughs> God formed him out of the dust of the ground. Now, Adam actually is Hebrew word for, for, for clay. Did I, did I hear, was your wife a wandering Jew like mine? or? My wife was, uh, um, my wife had the unfortunate, well, actually, it, God turned it into a good experience for her. She was uh, uh, 11 or 12, and she c complained a lot about heartache. You know, my heart hurts. Yeah. And uh, my, my, the, her nickname as a child was uh, Sarah Heartburn <laughs> because she was so dramatic. Uh, and uh, she would complain, complain about this stuff. And then she went through a period, I believe, in her mid-teen years where uh, young girls had become obsessed with the, just their physical identity and acceptance based on that. So she uh, also started um, uh, not eating right, a little eating disorder problem, got very, very thin. They speculated years later that that put stress on the heart. And uh, she, at, before I met her, uh, I had gone out with three women who had become Christians and all gave me the same, almost verbatim, you know, I really love you, you're a great guy, but I just can't hang with you anymore, you know, because I was a rock and roll DJ and did every drug known to man and, uh, you know, just uh, godless, <laughs> without hope in the world, but having a fun time on the surface. So, it, but the, the last one that broke up with me gave me a Bible and said, if you ever have trouble, you know, you know take a look at this. And Martha, in the meantime, uh, she was uh, going to school at Pepperdine, which is a predominantly Christian university uh, on the coast of Malibu. And she'd gone to Hebrew school. I mean, she was a real Jew. I mean, she, she speaks Hebrew, and she's, uh, they were well-schooled. My father-in-law explained it to me once that uh, when he was a boy, the Seder lasted most of the afternoon. When his uh, great-grandfather was a boy, like lasted all day. And by the time we were doing the Seder that they would invite me to, and I, I was a Reader's Digest, the condensed version of it, as everybody had the book, and it's like, okay, Scott, you're on, read it quick, come on, come on, hurry up, I want to get to this. It's like, it took about 14 and a half minutes, and just when we were eating, very cultural, uh, uh, secular Jews. And, and so Martha met this guy, his, and, I, and I know him, and he's, uh, I, I'm, very grateful that uh, he came into her life. A guy by the name of Vince Van Patten. His dad is an act, was an actor and Eight is Enough, and Vince has done some films and stuff. And oh, yeah, Van Patten, right, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, the brothers. And he, Vince was also a, a professional tennis player for a while, which is very impressive, and got as high as 27 in the world. 
And uh, she, Martha dated him before she knew me. And uh, he, yeah, he t told her about Jesus and the simple, simple grace believer. He doesn't make it complicated. And she started thinking about all of this because when they took her to the doctor at 12 and had her diagnosed, uh, the doctor consulted with the parents out in the hallway. And Martha was, you know, like to know what was going on. She's a lot like the other. And Martha, <laughs> she busied herself. She, she went to the door, you know, and was like listening. And what she heard was, uh, she, she, it's not a very common condition. It's, a, it's sort of like arrhythmia in which the electric impulses to the heart uh, get falter. And uh, it can be regulated and with beta blockers. And she should be okay. And the mother said, should be. And the doctor said, "Well, there's always a remote chance that uh, you know, that she that she could die." And yeah, so and she heard that at 12. So it was like game on. It's like I could die. Whatever I want, whatever I want to accomplish or do in life, I better do it now. And she was all about doing it now. I mean, and you've heard. No offense, Tanya, and we love you for it because somebody has to do it. But women have a plan, a well formulated plan. And they want things to tick off at a certain time. You know, I've been dating you for this long. We should know. Let's you know, let's move it along here. Come on, come on. You know, you're married, and it's like then after a while, it's like you know, I want to have kids. Let's let's move that along, and let's let's get into a house. This is a good time to get into a house. Bang, 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 all that stuff. So when she died uh, just after her 27th birthday, she she was a very successful saleswoman selling radio time, making six figures. She had her first child. She had taken us from our first house into our second house that through some sort of bizarre kind of financing that got us in. She was a very highly motivated individual, and I sensed that she didn't really know that she had a, a great deal of time. As a matter of fact, she stood in church, uh, Jack Hayford's church. I, I was told this uh, at the funeral. Her best friend came up to me and said, I don't know if I should tell you this, but uh, uh, six months ago, Martha was in our church on a Wednesday night, and she turned to me out of nowhere, and the pastor wasn't talking about this, she said, Cammy, life is really funny. You know, one second I can be here talking to you, and the next second uh, we could be standing face to face before God. I thought, and that's exactly, for, you know, I don't know, people argue about, or, do you go to sleep, or is it out of the body present with Christ immediately? I, you know, I don't argue about stuff like that, but it seemed like, uh, you know, Peter was told that he knew what was coming down the pike for him. I mean, if you believe the Holy Spirit leads and guides you in all the truth and shows you things to come, um, you know, it, it's, I don't think she was fearful of death, but I think she knew she wasn't going to be around the line. But she always kept this from me. She told her girlfriends, but uh, she loved me like uh, nobody else ever has. You know? Wow. And she was concerned about it. That's amazing. What a... What a strange part, but strange blessing. What an incredible woman she must have been. Uh, hey, look, uh, we all we all have a very incredible Savior who has given us his mind and uh, and has put a bit of his spirit in us. And, uh, yeah, we all – but she tapped into that potential because, like it, we, Luke and I were saying the other night, you, know, you can learn the gospel, but there's a difference between learning and then surrendering and just really believing. And that's when the transformation and the lightness of, of being comes, because you realize you're dead. It's like well, that, that's a place of no option. There's no options left. Yeah. God doesn't leave you any other option. That's yeah. Like and the tr and the truth is, we you know even if you're healthy, uh, people don't understand the futile state that they've inherited, as Peter said. Right. Right. You have to be made cognizant of this. Now, as far as the name is concerned, the new name. I don't know. But to me, it all means loved. To me, my new name is is loved of God. John is a good good example. John was loved of God. That's, that's, that's boasting in the Lord. Amen. That's how much you know, He loves me. Before we were, uh, I think the program of progress says we were graceless. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so 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 that's my kind of take. But on 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 the Hebrew name, it would be it would be Adam is like clay or dirt or actually red was another is close to the Edom. Where we get the words for the Edomites were red, uh, but but basically made a, a, out of uh, out of the dust, and uh, and formed uh, formed the man. And then the new Adam, the new type, would be would, would be the one Yeshua who um, 
who 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 saved us. So I, I would say that, that that my new name is is saved or loved. With a D on the end, and and etched, uh, yeah, and never removed. Never. Yeah, it's as clear as can be, John six forty seven. You believe you have eternal life. He has. He has eternal life. God doesn't. Not not an Indian giver doesn't take it away. It's it, and it's because we're saved to His glory. And that you know, Ephesians talks about that. That that everyone is going to see and marvel at God's grace to us, who the fallen ones think are just animals and don't deserve anything. For for His name's sake. Yes, for His name's sake, He's not going to let anybody screw up His batting average. You know, it's going to, and it's a thousand percent. He's he lost but one. And, and that's all. That's and he's all. Judas is, is it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else who uh, calls, believes, trusts, um, he's got him, and uh, they can live a life of wretched uh, accents and pay the consequences, perhaps, in this life. Or if they have a great constitution, uh, drink and smoke like my grandmother did, and went duck hunting every morning until she was a hundred and one before she finally died. You know, but it, it, but it's, you know, it's to his goal. Now I know how long I want to live and what I want to do when I'm living there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I come out of a rather eccentric family. She was 4'11", liked to, liked to go duck hunting, drank bourbon straight, and non-filtered cigarettes were her, her, her cigarette of choice. But she was an excellent artist. Hang on, let me just show you one, one quick thing. This was a... Uh, this was uh, something, this is one of many, this, she painted this in 1931. Wow. Well, you know, uh, and, no, and nobody else in the family, uh, you know, all we can draw is like uh, overdraw or bank accounts. <laughs> so I can't etch anything. It's just, yeah, it's, uh, the grace, uh, the, the, the grace is, in, it's just, you can, you're never going to fully understand it, but it's important to, Keep plugging away at it because there's the freedom, and you don't. And I, I've gotten to a point where I realized on vacation, you owe it to people to make it real simple because you never know what they went through uh, before. We know of God's grace, but they might have, uh, you know, just had a horrible upbringing and uh, life's dealt them bad things, and they're bitter and they're angry at God, even though they claim not to maybe believe in God. So then, if if you uh, if, if these Three preaching guys and people are confused about uh, what the gospel is. They start saying things like, "You better repent of your sins or go to hell." That the at, the response usually, if they don't say this, you know, he can go to hell. You know, he can go you know, because or he can go screw himself. That kind of uh, they're, you're very angry and bitter. So if you but you just got to tell them the simple gospel and trust the Holy Spirit that he'll. He'll work with you. You say the truth, and you'll let me get into their heart, and I know their experiences. And all. Yeah. Forgive us for digressing a little bit here. That's all right. This is interesting, and it's fun. So uh, uh, I would say that the street preacher comment you made there, uh, uh, yeah, the, a lot of people who watch these street preachers because of their bad manners and their bad message, they, they basically say that they can go to hell, not me. Or they say, if that's what a Christian is, Never want to be one. Yeah. So they're not. They're not. For the most part, 99 out of 100 street preachers are not ambassadors for Christ. No. They're not telling. They're not telling the true message of salvation, and they're mean-spirited bullies. Okay. Let's let's go on to this. There's only a couple other things you want to cover, and then all the rest will end. And we'll save for next time because uh, we still have a lot left to cover in this subject. I know that we've digressed, but I think it's all worthwhile. It's part of fellowship. Doesn't have to always be some uh, structured uh, study. Um, let me read uh, something from Hebrews. Hebrews 4:14-15 says, uh, "Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities." but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
Uh, and I'll read Hebrews 7.26 at the same time. For such a high priest became uh, us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins, and then for the people's, uh, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Uh, so here we have, again, uh, the, the theme of this study is, let's see, looking back at all these things in the Old Testament, how they are, are really the New Testament kind of concealed and hidden. Uh, Paul talked about how things were hidden and they were a mystery, and uh, we, we use the terminology, they're shadows, they're pictures, they're types. So we have this high priest in the Old Testament, and Paul is talking about comparing the high priest, what, who he was and what he did, compared to our high priest, Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did. I know you guys have something to say about that. <laughs> Mitch? <laughs> well, all right. Uh, I've been talking too much. Well, no, yeah. no, you came into the conversation late. I just the, uh, you know, the whole the whole book of Hebrews is pointing to the to, to, to the idea here that, that that everything that the Jews were doing up until the point of Christ was was coming to uh, a climax, and uh, all the shadows, all of these things, were pointing to one event, and that was and that was um, Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins, and so now. Why is there a need to go back to the old way where the high priest got up, you know, daily, which offered up sacrifices that could never take away sins? But this one, once and for all, sat down after it was finished at the right hand of the Father. These words are significant because the fruition of the ritualistic thing that was done year after year came to pass in Christ. And when it did, the Jews wanted to say, oh, well, we're, we'll just keep on doing this. We, we'll just keep on going back to Moses because we don't want to see what the end of the, the trail. We just want to keep going the way we were going. And God is saying, no, 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 no. What was happening here is <laughs> this, this was the coming attractions for you to see the sign in the road for when it came. So when it passed by, I said, well, no, no, God wants us to keep perpetually doing Doing the, doing the signs and the sacrifices, and they missed it. They didn't see it. Yeah. And 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 that was that was the, the message here is that the that who has believed our message, right? So that that's so significant that the Messiah came, and it was prophesied that he was going to come, and that the Jews wouldn't believe it. As a matter of fact, was it twelve ten in Zechariah where it, where it says. They will look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as a, as a son. So here, here you have it. The Jews, the, 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 it all came to pass that they would, they would be doing this. All of these things that would be, would be pointing towards God, and that would, they would be blind. They wouldn't be able to see him when he came, unless the Holy Spirit opened up your eyes to see the picture. But the picture was always very clear. Really, if anybody really read the Old Testament to the New Testament, if they see it, if their eyes are open, it's a very clear message. I didn't see it, though. I read the Bible. You didn't, you didn't see it? Not at first, no. Neither did I, to tell you the truth. Right? Because yeah. I, I went to church. We went to Catholic church. We heard about Jesus, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. And we, I, I, we, were, we were told things. But it wasn't, when I started looking at the Bible, I didn't see it at first, no. I was reading it, trying to learn it, had it in my hands. Then I, I don't know why God did this. When I said, because I was saying, well, this is a great book. It's a wonderful book. Well, we have the Tao, though. We have Buddha, the Tao. We have Islam. 
It's not that the Quran is a good book. There's a lot of moral people following it. All right, they might be some shooting each other. There's tons of, of upstanding Muslims. Yeah. What's the difference? What makes this book? So a whole bunch of people, right, are following this book. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, well, I started following it. I started trying to, you know, be blessed by the righteousness. If I just do this, this, that, the other thing, God will bless my life. Here, God, look, I did this, I did that, I did the other thing, and I did, ah, oh, man, I got angry that day. All right, I'll try again. All right, I'm doing good, God. Where's the blessing? Where's the, where is it? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. If, if, if that's what this book is all about, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why? Because I'm unrighteous to begin with. I don't know. what I don't, I'm, I'm just like praying. I'm, I'm having faith, and I want God to change my life and do this, that, the other thing. And I'm like, why does anybody follow this dumb book? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, this book. I, I'm saying I pray it. I'm just, it should work. I should. I. 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 Well, it should be like a genie in a bottle. I should rub it, right? The genie should pop out. I should get my grant my three wishes. It should come through. Yeah. So I open up the Bible and I ask God, why is this book not working? And I did the, one of these. Pink. The stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, the capstone, a stone that makes men stumble and a rock that makes men fall. It was like this. Boom. What did God just do? <laughs> All of a sudden, my eyes were open and I was saved. I opened up the book and Jesus was on every page. That's how I got saved. That's what happened. Praise God. Well, really, that's what you just said. The last half a sentence is really the whole point of this whole subject we're studying. And that is that Jesus is on every page. But you don't see it. Uh, it's, when, I, when we started this uh, the, a few weeks ago, uh, the first episode, and I recap this point today, is that we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story, that the, uh, the Savior has come. Uh, and, and they were looking forward to a Savior coming, and we look back and say, He came, and we believe in Him. And, and, and uh, So looking back to it through that lens, it's easy for us to see him in every page, whether it's uh, the, the covering uh, that he gave Adam and Eve when they had killed the animal, or whether it's the, the blood sacrifice of Abel, or, 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 or on and on, or the lifting up of the serpent from Moses on the brazen serpent on the pole. All, all these things, we look back at that, and we say, that's Jesus, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. That's his bloody sacrifice for us. We look back. It's not like... It's only in the New Testament. It's certainly not not only uh, mentioned by Paul. It's through the, all the scriptures, this blood sacrifice, and it's it's hidden and, and mysterious. But, but we look back, and it's not mysterious to us because we see it through uh, looking back. Tanya. Yeah, I just was going to say uh, a question, really, um, because the same thing happened to me. I didn't see all this at first either. It, it seemed to happen years after I got saved. I was able to go back and actually read the Old Testament a little bit and, and I was like, oh wow, that sounds just like Jesus, you know, the stuff about uh, Joshua, or jo was it Joseph, the one who uh, got sold by his brothers. I get the names all mixed up all the time. But like uh, everything, Joseph. yeah was I could see how it pointed to Jesus. My question, do you think that that is neat to be able to do that, to go through the Old Testament and see all of this? Because you know how there's milk and then there's meat. Do you, I would consider this more of a meat instead of a milk kind of thing, but what do you guys think? Neither. I think it's a confirmation to you. Okay. So when you begin to see Jesus in every page of the Bible that, that's not coming from you, <laughs> that this being revealed to you by the Holy Spirit who wrote, who wrote the book, and it's to uh, continually, his, as if you're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit's primary work with you is to uh, build you up and to edify you, to encourage you and to, your, to remind you of uh, who you are, that, the, that you, you know, because the devil's job is damage control. He got his ass kicked and handed to him on a platter 2,000 years ago, and now he has to basically uh, rewrite history or uh, add things in or mix things up and keep it confusing to prevent you from knowing who you really are in him. Yeah, so I, that's my, I, I think it's more of a, 
uh, confirmation. Yeah. You start sometimes putting the focus on yourself, which is a, a hallmark of uh, Lordship Salvation types um, who are working things out. And, and they, they try real hard, bless their tiny pointed little heads. <laughs> and then when they start to realize that they're failing, uh, they ignore that. And the best way to do that is to look at somebody else and go, and, and then start to judging a, a moral relative. Well, I'm not as bad as so and so. You know, there's a lot of backbiting kind of stuff. I wanted to talk about Hebrews and uh, the milk and the meat. First of all, of course, uh, the, the Jews separate the milk and the meat. It's not kosher to eat milk and meat at the same time. Uh, but, but the 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 being fed on milk, in in, in my opinion, is is being fed on the law. And these Jews were 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 were, were they they. You know, I think we're like part of this sect of the Pharisees that believe that you had to uh, be circumcised and follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. And they were, they were, they, they were, they were. Th this was the warning here that you're not walking by by the Messiah. You're going back to Moses. And so you're fed on you were fed on milk. The meat here is Christ. It's the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. You were fed on fed by milk in the desert here. You know and and. And, and and you're not getting the fact that the, that 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 the meat, the thing that the the, save, the salvation of Jesus Christ, all this stuff that Moses was talking about was pointing to Christ, and and so so now uh, you're, you're you're rejecting, and this is what it talks about. You know, if you if if you if you continue the sin, right, and 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 this sin being disbelief in the Savior, mm -hmm. and and. and you know, you now you don't have a savior. There's no longer exists a savior for you. Why? You've rejected the savior. You went back to the law, and this is what Hebrews was all about. It was about it was about Jews that claimed to be Christians, claimed Christ, saw Christ, but didn't see salvation. They were confused. They wanted to go back to Moses. So I would say the milk was. The milk was was the word of God, the law, and the, and, and and the meat was salvation through Jesus Christ and, and, and eating the flesh and blood of Christ. Yeah, okay. and when it, when when, when people are take, when people are taken out of slavery, it, it takes a lot of years, generations, for them to make a transition to understand who they now are, that they're that they're free. They have, it happened with the Jews. It's, it's happened to some extent, uh, you know, with the uh, American uh, Negro. You know, it's like. It's been a long, long time now, but they still a lot have still have a victim mentality, and they still think of themselves in a certain way. And uh, so, but it, the, the other thing about the um, I, oh, I'm sorry, I just kind of lost the train there. But about uh, well, go on, maybe. Oh, uh, wait, let me show you something here. Look at this, brother. See this? this and this. Look at us. See this? Hold on, I put on my glasses because I can't see anything. Yeah. Now what you what you what I'm going to suggest you do, brothers and sisters, you could get a pen and a piece of paper here, and then when you think of something, you make a little note. And that way you won't have to say, "Oh, I forgot, I forgot." Give yeah. me a minute. Take I forget it. to take the notes though. I forget oh, the notepad. It's it's just a like a vicious circle, isn't it? It's yeah. the it's the senior moment. But here here's what I wanted to say. Okay, if, if we're told that uh, upon believing that uh, you know, these things are imputed to you, righteousness and all, and your holiness is is contingent upon you being in Him, the fullness, the fullness of the Godhead lives in you already, and you are uh, Colossians two ten, you are complete in Him. So then John uh, tells us in an epistle, I think First John, he says that Jesus Christ has set Himself apart to meet our need for growth in truth and holiness. So what's being said to my mind is that, look, you already are. It's already done. It's a spiritual event here. The flesh has been cut away and it's it removed a spiritual circumcision. All these things that you can't see in another person. Uh, but so the, the growth is actually, uh, we're going to be bringing you up to speed as to who you really are, and it's an arduous process because the definition of the gospel to me is if, if it sounds too good to be true, like wildly too good to be true, uh, then it's, that's probably the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it's got a little mixture of stuff that maybe you have to do and work this out and don't I forget. Think, yeah. 
Yeah, but yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut. Oh, you. I'm, I'm done. That was it. But the, the, I just wanted to say that 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 the, the spiritual walk for me, like I didn't see, and I think that God does this on purpose. He kind of leads us kind of blindly, like the Jews, and just kind of lets us go on until He decides to give us revelation. Amen. Now I was in a, I was saved. I was happy. I was elated, and I went to a Lordship church. And I sat under lordship preaching for many years, and I, and my spiritual like like I didn't see all of this, and then so I was being fed on milk. Here I was elated. I believed in Christ. I felt good, and then all of a sudden I didn't get the good news. I got oh yeah, but you know what? You need to repent. What was that video I did? You need to repent. You're just a dirty, grubby sinner, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? And so now all of a sudden I'm in this grub. <laughs> For, for all these years, and I'm, I'm like like halfway limping through my salvation until God like made these events happen, church splits and coming out to, to, to be in an Arminian church, then back to a Calvinist church, a Grace church, go back and forth to this church and that church, and after being pinballed back and forth a couple times, like a pinball between uh, uh, bumpers, uh, 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 all of a sudden God shakes me up and goes, yeah, but uh, this is Grace. Yes. And then all of a sudden I, I was fed on, on meat. But first I had to go through being fed on milk for a long time, I would say, and living in this dumb cycle of, uh, of uh, doing good works, feeling as if God should bless me, God not blessing me, then doing bad works and feeling that God could curse me, and then just get, being in this big uh, up and down roller coaster cycle of Lordship salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the feelings of guilt, the feelings of inadequacy, and then to find out what grace was, and then then starting the, to 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 live by grace, and 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 it still it still haunts me. The guilt still haunts me. It haunts me. And I'm like, why? Well, for well, I, I did a, an article on autism and how how we particularly have problems because uh, you know because of inadequacies because of course we're antisocial it's hard for us to uh, to relate to people and then you go to a church and you can't relate to people and they're treating you they're just stepping on you know and yeah. you never know why and and the other thing is 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 you're seeing things you're you're talking about grace and they're and they're stepping on you when you, every time you talk about grace oh no 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 you still need to work so, and then you're like, well, I don't understand this. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like God loves me. And then you get this hatred. You go, well, why should I love a God that's beating me like this? Yeah. You know? Yeah, everybody taking out works insurance. Yeah, sure, Jesus paid for our sins. And that, but the, I, I call them the Yava tribe. It's like they can't just leave it as the simple gospel, which is what, only three sentences. And it's, and it's you know. Not, it's declared as, as the gospel, so there's no confusion there. I declare unto you the gospel, and then they give it. And then, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but you still have to uh, not forsake the gathering of the brethren. You, you're you, like the Israelites, you right? Have to do this. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. They are the, 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 the missing tribe. You're back, in the, you're back in the desert. I'm saved. I'm through the Red Sea. Pharaoh, you know, his, his, his chariots are under the water. This is great and wonderful. Oh, I'm back in the desert. Tanya, did you raise your hand to say something? Oh, no. I just know exactly what he's talking about. I, I, I've had several of those kind of people that I've had to block. Um, you know, I, I'd talk about grace, and they'd say, yeah, but works without, or faith without works is dead. I mean, every time. And I just block them. Don't you love James? <laughs> oh, <gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Martin Luther did. <laughs> He's just kindling. Let me uh, uh, comment on your last few uh, the subjects you've been discussing here. The, first of all, the idea of, of, of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, that um, you, you were just talking about. Uh, I, I made a video about uh, one of my favorite books of the Bible. and I, I listed them as John, Galatians, and Hebrews. And I, I know I've talked to Mitch about this privately a few times about Hebrews. I, th I believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, but because to me, Hebrews and, and uh, Galatians are saying the same thing. Uh, Hebrews is like Galatians and John mixed together because the first 
chapter of John tells you about the deity of Christ. The Word became flesh and lived among us and so on. And then the first chapter of, of Hebrews is the best chapter on the deity of Christ you'll find anywhere. But then the rest of Hebrews is like Galatians. It's just basically just saying, keep your Judaism out of this. Judaism doesn't have anything to do with this. Except it tells you about, you know, the, the high priest is Jesus now. Not you Forget the old high priest, the old ways of sacrifice. Jesus made the sacrifice. He doesn't have, no more sacrifices are needed. He died once for all. So Hebrews and Galatians are basically saying it's faith alone, no religion required. Forget the religion. Keep it, don't mix it together. So I grew to love Hebrews even though I feared it for years because I didn't understand it. Uh, but the idea, for me, I didn't have the experience that you guys are uh, talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, being in the works of the Lordship camp. I never was in that camp from the beginning. But what I have done is almost all my time on YouTube has been fighting against the works Lordship Salvation people because they are attacking the blood atonement. They're spitting in the face of our Savior saying, that's not enough. It's not sufficient. Believing in Jesus for your salvation, no, you've got to do your part too. And it's the biggest insult, and that's been my whole ministry on YouTube, is fighting against the works, the works people. Even though, for some reason, as I read the Bible the first time, I never was confused about that. It was clear as day to me from the very beginning. It's believe, 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 believe. I, you know, even though I saw a problem text every once in a while, I didn't understand it, I still had no confusion in my mind about, hey, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you shall be saved, period. So, uh, um, but let me move on, unless you have something else to say, to uh, this final point I want to make here, and then we can close this, this study here. Um, let's look at, um, we talked about the veil, that what the veil in the temple represented, uh, uh, the, and then Jesus uh, dying on the cross and the veil being torn, and that representing that the barrier between man and God now is torn open, and man now has access to God because Jesus paid for the sins. The sin's not a barrier, Jesus paid for the sin. So in Hebrews 10.20 it says, By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. So the veil and his flesh, his flesh being torn, the veil being torn, now we have access. Just like um, uh, the high priest didn't, the public didn't have access. The high priest had to go under that veil once a year. But now that's settled, it's solved. But let's look now at Col Colossians 2.17. And it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now, this sums up exactly the whole subject of this whole study, and that is that the Old Testament, all these things, the veil, the blood sacrifices, the tabernacle, all those things that we discussed in this whole study for several weeks now, these are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is Christ. That's the substance. So in the Old Testament, they looked forward to a Savior being coming and providing salvation. And we look back and say, he came. He accomplished it. It's finished. Um, I'm going to, I want to pick up next time. We're going to really go into the law and the, the, the sacrifices and other things. We still have a lot more to discuss in this. Uh, but let's, let's hear any uh, final comments on that last point. Uh, and then... Uh, I like to keep this, it's been a, a little bit more than two hours now. I'm having a lot of fun, so I don't mind talking longer. But we started late, so. Yeah, yeah we did. And then, and then Scott. Feeling Scott, me. Feeling Scott, the guilt again. Yeah, Scott was David, exactly. See how good I am at putting it. your large salvation background surfacing again. <laughs> yeah, well, Scott, was, Scott was tardy. <laughs> we were all tardy. We were. So we, were all, we all broke the law. Scott, I thought I told you that you didn't have to wear that dunce cap after all, and you still have it on. 
<laughs> I got shorn a little too much. That I, you know, it was like a dog. I, I had a revelation, and then I <laughs> then it actually came to fruition. My gosh, I am going bald. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, these. It says right there in Colossians that these old things in the old scriptures were shadows. So the idea of being a shadow or a picture, and there's other other verses that uh, we cited earlier that Paul talked to about being uh, shadows and pictures. So the, the idea of being a, a, a shadow of a future event uh, is not some new modern use to describe these things. It actually says in the scriptures, those were a shadow of things to come, but now Jesus Christ is the substance. And Tanya is going to make a comment on that, and then uh, uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll close the the feed for the world, and then we can talk alone for a little bit, and, and, then, and then I'll go on with uh, things other things I've got to do. Um, Tanya? Um, what am I commenting on again? Just about the whole shadowing of Jesus? Yeah, the, well, either the last point I made or anything you want to say uh, regarding anything we discussed today, uh, but the, the idea that uh, we get to look back through this lens, we have the benefit. But the, the people in the Old Testament, they didn't have the benefit. Uh, they were like, it's like this, this guy summed it up really well. Uh, I don't know who wrote this, but I quoted it several times. It says, uh, it is almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out of play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience of the play, those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words and events in this play. So we are the audience looking back uh, at these events, but we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story. It's like uh, I, there's a lot of really good shows uh, that uh, I like watching. I like watching Battlestar Galactica and The Wire and Game of Thrones and stuff. But, you know, when you watch these things the first time, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is revealed to you. But after you've seen it and you watch it a second time or a third time, you learn more because you know it in context, and looking back, you catch things you never caught the first time. And that's how I see, as we go through the Old Testament, we can see things that we didn't realize when we read it originally. Uh, some people start reading the Bible from Genesis 1. A, a lot of people start reading in Matthew. Uh, but wherever you start reading it, uh, you're not going to really understand the whole thing uh, until you first understand Jesus and what he accomplished, and then when you go back, then it is clear. But in, before then, it's like Paul said, uh, these things were hidden, they were mysteries, and now you should see things clearly. Jesus is the substance, before it was all shadowy. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I even wrote my little note up there so I wouldn't forget that... Um, I, I think that, that, yeah, that is the mystery that Paul was talking about. Um, you know, to them, they, they didn't have the lens of the gospel like we do. And, um, and it even said, I can't remember where it was, that Luke, I think it's in Luke or something, that Jesus, and this is before Paul even, that Jesus opened up their understanding to the scriptures so they could go back and do exactly what we're doing is see Christ all in it. And uh, so I just I just think that's really cool yeah, to be able to and, do that. And when, he, and when he saw fit, which is something Luke was alluding to earlier, that you know, uh, we, we, we didn't yeah. find out that God was one and, and monotheism entered the world when God chose to reveal it to one man. It's, it's we are uh, we're very clever human beings, and we've accomplished you know, a lot of great things, but basically we are hosts, and you're either going to be surrendering and yielding to God's plan of salvation and be influenced by his righteousness and the Holy Spirit in you, or uh, it's open season on you, and you can, 
you can a lot of things can pop in your head and you're doing certain things, but uh, it's really uh, not uh, you that's doing them. You're you just signed on with what you think is good reasoning, but it may be from the devil because he can make things sound very reasonable. A lot of people. A lot of people believe this, uh, the, the new world order and one world government, everybody get on the same currency and let's all work together, like canned heat sang about in the 60s. You know, sounds good on paper. It's like about your, on your communist video. It's like communism you know, sounds good on video. Mitch did a video on that. It, it, but the problem is you always uh, it looks good on paper and the, the intellectuals like it, but inevitably you always have to hire a goon squad to enforce it because it runs contrary to man's nature, which is to achieve and make his own mark and you know, have his own accomplishments and, uh, you know, and then it dwindles down to you, you pretend to pay me and I'll pretend to work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you guys, excuse me for one minute. I hate even missing any word you say because you're all so fascinating. Excuse me one minute. <laughs> yeah, well I try to do one thing every day. I try to take over the world. That's yeah. what I try every day. I'm going to take over the world. It's 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 a certain type of personality profile that I recognize. And I have in-laws that live in D.C. And uh, I was just with my daughter in Europe. We were in Geneva, which is second only to New York and the United Nations for being a diplomatic type of center. And I thought I was taking a walk one night and uh, turned the corner, and these young girls were like looking at me, and I'm going, "Wow, I'm showing up on the radar. That hasn't happened in 30 years." And then it went another block, and it was even more blatant. And then I turned another corner, and then I saw some of these girls uh, dressed provocatively in storefront windows. And I thought, oh, red light district, yeah. And it went on for blocks and blocks and blocks. There's only about 500,000 people there. And I thought, well, that personality that wants to power and control and run other people's lives, and they think they're smarter than the average bear, uh, these people also have a – they like to – Go to prostitutes to maybe be demeaned or something, or put back in their place. I, it's, I, that's the psychology of it. I don't fully understand, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it was there, and it was sad to see, but it's a fact of life. Yeah, there are some people, and they're around, and they're rich, and they're unseen, and they're pulling the strings of our so-called elected representatives that have our best interests at heart. <coughs> yeah, sure. They do. Exactly. Yeah. I'm looking at this idea of the veil. What bothers me about the veil? is there's just two meanings of sin and the law. Because they kind of go hand in hand. Like, it, yes, the barrier for us to get through the curtain is our sin. But the reason why the barrier is there is because of the law. So, so the curtain represents, I think, like two things. It, it represents the law, and it represents our sin not being able to go get across the curtain. But a lot of people say it's our sin, and they don't recognize that one of the major things that Jesus did was take the burden of the law off of us. Yes. They're trying to put us back under the law, saying, oh, no, you can't erase the Ten Commandments. You can't erase that. You can't. You No, no. You No, it was our sin. It was He died for our sin. But you have to realize he, that when he died, the barrier, that the, the, the death, the separation, was the, his death meant the separation from the law. Uh, as as a criterion for condemnation, that doesn't mean we don't practice righteousness. And so, I think that a lot of people, that, when I mention that the veil is a picture of the law, they go right to no, it's a picture of sin, and you it, can't separate one from the other. It de it it depends on it's the law. It it depends on in whose hand the law is in and in who is administering the law. If it's Satan administering the law, uh, then he, he, he'll use that to uh, put you under constant condemnation because the strength of, the law, of the strength of sin is in the law. Until the law was presented, I had no idea of the extent and the power of the sin in my life. But when God deals with, uh, dealt with sin and the law, and he took the written code, which was held against us, and he nailed it to the cross so that there's now nothing separating you and there's no condemnation now or ever. Okay. You approach the throne of grace where prior to that you had the law. And the, you know, you're looking at the law and at the same time focusing so intently upon it that the sun has been blocked out and is no longer shining upon your face. Face means 
not only countenance, but face means intelligence. Yeah. Right, you can't. You're blind. Yeah, Romans six fourteen. What does it say? That the sin shall no longer have dominion over you, since you are no longer under the law. You will grow and transform and become the likeness of Christ to the extent that the sun is shining upon you, and it, and He always is. It's you that remains an enemy at times in your own mind because you're self-condemning or the devil is condemning you, and He's doing it through something that God says is good, but when Satan uses it, it's very bad. This is what made Paul controversial. As soon as Paul started talking like that, that's when he got into trouble. And you know what? I was as soon as I started, ask, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was it's, just going to ask about something like that. You're going in the direction of what I was going to ask. Oh, go ahead. Um, the law was given to the Jews yes. only. Like, they're to establish them as a nation, right? God wasn't concerned about anybody else except for the Jews. And since... Um, Oh man, I was going somewhere with this. Hold on, I had to keep it in my mind while y'all were talking. Oh, I should have taken a note, Luke. Time to think of it because I was going to say the same thing. I got some scripture here that makes it. Okay, point. it was just. Go ahead, you do it. I think you this know where is I'm the going. Point that I made in a study called Biblical Christianity, and one of the th one of the things that we uh, I referred to is Romans two fourteen to fifteen. I'll just read that. But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meaning while accusing or else excusing one another. So the, the point that uh, I think you were making, and I was thinking, you know, I was thinking the same thought as you were about to say that, uh, is that this law... Um, was not given. This, this is the problem I've always had with everybody who's tried to like tell me like the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments weren't given to us. They were given to Jews for a purpose. Uh, what, what what Gentiles were given was a conscience, the law written in our heart, but it wasn't spelled out. See, uh, you know, it was like we had a conscience, but with the Jews, God said. I'm going to spell it out for you. I'm going to put it in writing. <laughs> you know, I'm going to make it so clear. These are the things I want you to do. Okay, we we didn't get those things, so we had a conscience instead. Um, but the, uh, the the law, is, when we think of Jews and the law, then of course Paul sums it up and says, "Well, the law is just a schoolmaster to teach you that you're uh, you you need a savior." Yeah. Not only that, but uh, eventually, is is. Somebody, I forget who said it, uh, Mitch, I think, is that uh, faith is actually superior to the law in, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, the results that will, that will come about. Because, because you realize there's nothing between you and God, that, you, that it's grace, it, it creates intimacy, uh, honesty, a real relationship. And um, if you played sports when you were younger, you look play tennis, and I did some stuff, and I've worked... I, under different types of coaches, there are basically two types: ones who are strict, and if you screw up, they'll you know they'll let you know, and it's like you're condemned and feel horrible about it. And then the other who are constantly encouraging, and you get a sense that the the coach really loves you. John Wooden was a beloved basketball coach and a winning coach, and he rem he remained friends with his former players till the day he died. They loved the guy. Uh, and love is all will always is the most powerful force will motivate and bring out the best in people. It's true and sincere. And that's and God's love for us by grace is will, will produce the desi desired results. But you got to believe, you know. Uh, you and Mitch, yep, go ahead, Mitch. The uh, this whole subject of the law. Uh, that's exactly where we're going to pick up next Sunday. Perfect. Uh, we're going to be talking about the law. And then we're going to really go into more detail on the actual sacrifices. Uh, so that's right where we want to go next time. So we, we can end on that now, leading leading us into it. But uh, okay, so yeah, okay. what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm so happy that um, you two guys can join Tanya and me. Tanya has been faithfully; she's the one that got me started, interested in these hangouts. And she's helped me with all the technology and just helped me every way she can. So she's been like my number one sidekick on this all along. Uh, and I've had other people 
come uh, and participate as much as they possibly can. That I really love and value. I hope I hope I can get Lisa uh, Harang back and uh, uh, Salam uh, Young Baptist back uh, and others. Um, but having you two guys with me is just such a, a blessing. Uh, everybody that's been on this panel for all these hangouts we've done, you are my favorite people on YouTube. That's why I have every one of you listed on a, on a section I call Defenders of the Faith. Because you are focused on one thing, defending faith alone and Christ alone. That's sufficient. That's what we need. That's what we should be preaching. And, uh, and uh, so I'm just well, I mean, I could talk to you guys all night, all day long, but I'm, I'm trying to keep the actual broadcast to about two hours. Even then, people complain it's too long to watch. So <laughs> what I'll do is uh, I'm going to let anybody make a final statement here, and then I'm going to end the broadcast, and then we can talk up, uh, uh, continue the uh, thing here, just talking privately for a little while, okay? okay? So uh, to start off, who wants to go first and uh, make any, like, closing statement here? Tanya. I'll go first because I have to go change a diaper. But anyway, not mine, my son. But anyway, um, I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I have really enjoyed this, even though I've had to kind of uh, come and go a little bit because I'm here alone with my son. Um, usually my husband babysits for me when I do these Bible studies, but he's not here. So, okay, he's starting to fuss. I love you guys, and... Uh, I would love to talk a little more if off air if you want to hang out for a minute. Um, and I'm looking forward to next week because I actually have um, a lot to say about the law and all of that kind of stuff that we're going to be getting into. I have some questions and everything. Well, Tanya, let me, let, love you too. Tanya, Tanya, let me give a plug. Let me give a plug for your Wednesday night show. Uh, but uh, Tanya, it's 6 p.m. Pacific and 9 p.m. Eastern. Tanya started a thing last Wednesday. It was a lot of fun. It's called like Bible trivia, and basically it's just a lot of fellowship. But we turn it into a game and have a fun talking about the Bible and have answering trivia questions. So uh, I hope you guys can join join Tanya for that. I I look forward to that every week too. Yes, uh, and just so people know, Wednesday it's it's going to be the first real uh, game for a prize, and it's the prize right. is actually going to be. My great great grandmother's homemade old fashioned chocolate fudge. Man. It's I'm making it. It's not from when she was it's not hers. I yeah. think it'd be fresh. But it's it's good. Older, older New Testament. <laughs> older New Testament. Older New Testament. <laughs> older New Testament. Uh it's actually here's the different topics. Okay. There's New Testament, Old <laughs> Testament. Objects slash events, places, Credit. numbers, Credit. and general. Yes, and Credit. it's gonna, it's kind of like Jeopardy. Like if you get the question, then the next question you get to pick the topic of the next question. Okay. So it's it's actually fun. We had a blast. We had like a test run last week of it, and we, I mean, we did it played for a couple hours straight. It was great. <laughs> so it'll yeah. be fun. that'll be Wednesday at 9 p.m. But Tanya uh, didn't give me any fudge. Tanya didn't yes. give me any fudge for women last time. No, I didn't. And you guys, you think Luke is such a nice, sweet guy? Wait till you see him play Bible trivia. He's quite the competitive dude. I was. Uh, that's I a, noticed yeah. that. Yeah, all all, t all tennis players are like yeah. that. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing because we're ending this up here. This thing popped up. Plug in unresponsive. And so remember oh, what happened? Oh no. Yeah, so right now it just happened. So what I'll do is uh, I'm going to ask uh, you guys to say something real quick, and I'll close the show, and then I'm going to start another one just so we can talk for a few more minutes, okay? And then I'll, I'll send you guys the link in your email real quick, okay? Sounds good. All right, so uh, Mitch and, and Scott, just say something here. Say goodbye to everybody and any final comment you want to make. Well, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, was it Romans 5, 14? Um, yeah. You know where he said that death reigned from Adam. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam, from Adam to Moses. In other words, there was basically saying that that, that there has been uh, condemnation from Moses from Adam to Moses. And what Paul was talking about was that 
you know, a lot of people will talk about um, sin not just being imputed to the Jews because the Gentiles didn't have the law. Mm -hmm. The Gentiles did have a law because death reigned from Adam to Moses. And so you know, basically Paul's whole, whole thing was bringing everybody together saying all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's a lot of Jews for Jesus out there saying, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we still, the, the Jews still had to follow Jewish law. And basically uh, Paul, Paul was saying, no, Jews and Gentiles are all the same.